Welcome you to the council and to our first meeting of the 2011-2000 or 2010-2011 uh, program year. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, three of the corporations which have been so important to the council. Organizations like this, of course, uh, depend upon generous individuals and generous corporations. And three of the corporations, which have been great friends of the council since the early 80s uh, and are very important supporters today, uh, are McCormick Company, T. Rowe Price, and uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, all three of those. <clears throat> And McCormick and T. Rowe Price are program sponsors this evening. And Lockheed Martin is adding their generous support for the cable television rebroadcast of the evening's program. And uh, so we indeed appreciate them for their past support and their present, present critical support. Our next uh, program, as most of you know, is with Steve Emerson. It's two weeks from tonight in this room. Mr. Emerson is recognized as one of the leading American experts on global terrorism, and uh, certainly, if not the leading expert, one of them, on terrorism and its groupings within the United States. So that should be a most interesting, uh, a most interesting evening. But tonight, of course, our topic is India-United States relations, uh, a topic which is of great interest to everyone here, of course, uh, for various reasons. Nearly everyone's interested in the culture and history of, of, of India, and uh, our more recent memories, going back to the end of colonialism, of course, define the contemporary political scene. And I think one of the first lectures that I heard on foreign affairs as a student was by Chester Bowles, who was then the United States ambassador to India, and he was so enthusiastic about India and democracy uh, it was a very uh, a moving address. He was one of America's great idealists of that period uh, of time. The Cold War era, of course, did not have equally enthusiastic support by Americans of all of India's policy because she was the great champion of the non-alignment movement, very consistent with philosophic conceptions. Over the past decade plus, relations with the United States, as all of you know, have become very, very important. President Obama has called this one of the great and important partnerships of contemporary American foreign policy. The, uh, the, the variety of things which we're interested are, in are many. Uh, the growth of India as a global power is inevitable. It's taking place before our eyes. She will be one of the three or four great powers within a relatively short period of time economically. And from that flows political changes as well. And we're all interested in one's vision of the emerging world order. And the problems of the area are multitudinous. And uh, they're all serious to us as well as to India. Uh, but whatever is in our minds is of secondary interest tonight because we're fortunate to have with us an authority on these things uh, with grave responsibilities for them and her comments upon uh, uh, circumstances in that relationship and the issues within the region are of, of, of great interest and will be deeply appreciated by us. We're delighted the ambassador is with us. Uh, she's had a distinguished career. Uh, since 1973, she's been a member of the Foreign Service. She's held a number of serious responsibilities. At one time, was essentially responsible for cultural diplomacy. She also served as a a minister in the prime minister's office. Uh, of course, she was uh, stationed here in the United States at the embassy as a minister uh, with an emphasis upon commerce. She's had distinguished positions within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in one period of time with responsibilities for South Asian, Asian uh, Association cooperation and, uh, and also for the United Nations in, in uh, international security. Prior to coming to the United States as the ambassador now, she was ambassador to Germany, and she's been ambassador here since 2009. Uh, it's with great interest and an enormous pleasure that I present uh, Ambassador Mira Shankar.
uh, Mr. Frank Hurd, President of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. I am honored to have this opportunity this evening to meet the members of the Council. This city has been witness to crucial events in the history of the United States, one of which has a link to India also. I am told that Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner while on board the ship HMS Minden, a ship built by a dockyard in Mumbai, India. <laughs> Today, as a flourishing port city, Baltimore is part of the great networks of trade and commerce which straddle the world. The Indian economy itself has undergone a remarkable transformation since the reforms of 1991, which deregulated the economy internally while liberalizing trade and investment policies. Over the past decade, India has been one of the fastest growing major economies in the world, and in recent years had reached a growth trajectory of eight to nine percent a year. Though this growth slowed down a little in the aftermath of the global financial and economic crisis, our economy has rebounded. After dipping to 6.7% in 2008, growth this year is expected to be in the region of 8.5%. The key national priority for India is to sustain a high growth path of 8 to 10 percent over the next decade and beyond, and to ensure that this growth is inclusive and benefits all sections of our people. Already one of the world's largest economies in terms of purchasing power parity, sustained growth will catapult India to one of the three or four largest global economies in the early half of this century. Moving a billion people towards greater prosperity, lifting those that remain in poverty, developing the human capacities and physical infrastructure to power this growth, and all this within the framework of a robust and vigorous democracy characterized by enormous diversity makes this ongoing process of transformation in India unique, exciting, and of broader relevance for the world. This transformation is also changing the way India interacts with the world. Growing trade and investment link India more closely with countries across the world than before. India's stakes in a global and regional environment of peace, stability, and broader prosperity have never been higher. The vital contribution that it can make in addressing key global challenges is increasingly recognized. And India sees the United States as a key partner in this process not only in building peace and stability, but also in fulfilling India's development goals and aspirations. When we look to the future of India-US relations, we derive enormous confidence from the very significant ground that we have covered in the relationship, especially over the past decade. During this time, our political engagement has strengthened significantly, our strategic understanding has deepened, and our cooperation has extended into new frontiers. The strength of ties between the governments has been nourished by the vitality of private partnerships and the warmth of ties between our peoples. It is a relationship which has been invigorated by broad political support and has met the test of public goodwill 
in both countries. Our relationship rests on the solid bedrock of shared democratic values, respect for fundamental freedoms, the rule of law, pluralism, openness, and a sense of enterprise. It is also based on our increasingly converging interests. The center of global challenges and opportunities is shifting rapidly to the Asia Pacific region. Asian economic surge is increasingly anchoring global economic growth and opportunities. The region is undergoing rapid changes and throwing up new challenges of reconciling historical differences with growing interdependence. India has always been conscious of its Asian identity, of its location at the strategic crossroads of Asia. The future of the Asian region is vital for India's own future. We share with the United States an interest in security and stability in a rapidly changing Asia, which reduces the risk of conflict and enhances opportunities for peaceful advancement. In our immediate neighborhood, our Prime Minister's vision is that the linked fortunes and destinies of South Asian countries <coughs> cast on us the responsibility to build a collective future of shared prosperity and peace by resolving our differences, connecting our people, opening our markets, and celebrating our common heritage. South Asia will have a profound impact on the future of Asian, indeed, global security and stability. It is home to a significant part of the global population and continues to face a wide range of political, economic, and social challenges. India has a vital stake in stemming and reversing the tide of violent extremism in our neighborhood and in building greater peace, stability, <coughs> prosperity, and moderation in Afghanistan and Pakistan. It is our desire to build a relationship with Pakistan defined by the power of cooperation rather than the perils of conflict. That is why we are seeking to re-engage in dialogue, though concerns on terrorism emanating from across our borders remain and need to be addressed. Despite our own challenges, we continue to provide economic assistance to our neighbors, including Afghanistan. We have provided assistance of nearly dollars 1.4 billion to Afghanistan across a wide range of infrastructure projects, human resource development, community assets, and rural development. Afghans consistently rate India as the best development partner. India will continue to support Afghans in developing the capacities to assume greater responsibility for their development and governance. We have regular and candid dialogue with the United States on Afghanistan and Pakistan. We exchange views and coordinate approaches on other developments in South Asia. We now increasingly talk about the wider Asian region and have commenced a dialogue on East Asia. We also discuss how we can facilitate development in Africa. Beyond the political dialogue, India and the United States have wide-ranging bilateral mechanisms for consultations that have brought a broad range of people into closer engagement and opened the doors for new possibilities of cooperation, creating a constantly expanding base for the participation. Our bilateral cooperation has entered new territories and explored new frontiers. Our counterterrorism cooperation 
has acquired new momentum after the Mumbai terrorist attacks, and we now have a new framework to strengthen our engagement, focusing on intelligence and information sharing, sharing of experience, and capacity building. Our militaries, once unfamiliar with each other, <clears throat> now hold regular dialogue and exercises, coordinate anti-piracy efforts, and have worked together on humanitarian missions. Our defense trade was negligible a decade ago. In the last few years, we placed orders worth over dollars four billion, and it could grow even further as India seeks to diversify sources of supply and develop its defense production capabilities through greater private sector participation. The India-US nuclear agreement signed in October 2008 not only removed a major problem that had shadowed and constrained bilateral relations, but created a deeper basis for economic ties and a more productive partnership on energy security, lessening reliance on fossil fuel and combating proliferation. We have also, in a mutual sign of confidence, expanded our cooperation in space with India's moon orbiter, Chandrayaan-1, carrying a US experimental payload which helped to identify water on the moon. There are good prospects for expanding this cooperation in the areas of space exploration, space flight, and exchange of data for weather prediction and climate trends. Further adjustment of the bilateral framework for cooperation in high technologies should truly reflect our strategic partnership. In the larger Asian and global context, both the US and India have an interest in protecting the global commons, maritime, cyber, and space domains. Free flow of information and trade across these commons is vital for both our economies. We need to also create appropriate norms for cyberspace to ensure that the freedom and anonymity provided by these pathways are not misused. <laughs> Economic ties are robust and growing. India-US trade doubled between 2004 and 2008, with US exports to India growing three times during this period. Trade, including trade in services, is broadly balanced. While the US is the largest source of foreign investment in India, Indian direct investment into the United States has been growing rapidly and on the basis of annual flows, exceeds US foreign direct investment in India in recent years. Between 2004 and 2009, Indian companies invested over dollars 5.5 billion in greenfield ventures in the United States and over $20 billion in mergers and acquisitions, helping to generate wealth and jobs in the US. Beyond the statistics is the fact that because India-US economic ties have been knowledge, technology, and people intensive, they have had a profound impact on the relationship that goes beyond the business sector. As we look to the future, we hope first to substantially expand our economic ties and help create jobs and prosperity in both countries. In part, this will be driven by global economic recovery and the relative health and competitiveness of the Indian and US economies. But we also recognize that the two governments working in partnership with the private sector can create conditions that raise our economic ties to a new level. The Indian economy 
will continue to be a huge opportunity, whether it is increasing power generating capacity fivefold in the next 20 years, or connecting India with itself and the rest of the world, or providing a wide range of services to the burgeoning urban dwellers and farm dependent rural population. Our investments in infrastructure alone over the next decade would require an investment of a trillion dollars. It is important in this context not to allow the voices of protectionism to constrain the potential for positive engagement and for both countries to benefit from the enormous opportunities that lie ahead. As social and economic development is a key focus area for us in India, developmental cooperation has become an important focus of our strategic partnership. Mm -hmm. Issues such as agriculture, energy, education, and health have a direct impact on the lives of common people. In India, for instance, people still remember fondly and with gratification the contributions made by the late Dr. Norman Borlaug, who helped usher the first green revolution in India in the 1960s that enabled us to increase our food grain production and to become self-sufficient. Today, we are working together with the US to revive the spirit that animated our cooperation and resulted in the Green Revolution. We have agreed to establish working groups in diverse areas related to agriculture, which should help us increase productivity and also contribute towards regional and global food security. Energy is another new emerging area of cooperation. Both our countries face similar challenges of dependence on energy imports and fossil fuels. And we both recognize the importance of addressing the challenge of climate change. For India, sustainable development is a necessity. Our long-term perspective plan on energy and our ambitious national action plan on climate change seek to increase the share of clean and renewable energy in our energy mix, increase energy efficiency across the economy, and expand our forest cover. We have launched a national solar mission and are committed to establish a strong manufacturing base in this field. In November 2009, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and President Obama launched a clean energy and climate change initiative to advance cooperation in clean and renewable energy and energy efficiency. We are working together to ensure speedy implementation of its various provisions, including of establishing a joint research center on clean energies. India is blessed with a young population, 50% of whom are below the age of 25 years. If India is to benefit from this demographic dividend, we need to ensure that this population is educated and has the requisite skills to contribute positively to the economy. Education has an important role in empowering and transforming the lives of our people. We hope to partner with the excellent US university system as we expand and reform our educational sector. Educational exchanges have contributed to strengthening our linkages and fostering greater collaboration in science and technology. There are at least 100,000 students from India who study in US universities today. As we in India move into higher gear with our educational reforms 
and towards a knowledge and innovation economy, there is an opportunity for us to enhance our ongoing academic exchanges and research collaboration. The spirit of innovation and intellectual quest would help us chart new frontiers in our relationship. The Singh Obama Knowledge Initiative, the Nehru Fulbright Fellowship Program, and the India-US Science and Technology Endowment will serve as catalysts for this purpose. There is thus today a very broad canvas before us to strengthen our strategic partnership. Both our governments are committed to build on the excellent foundations that we have created to fulfill our common objective of creating a partnership that not only benefits the people of both countries, but also responds to the global challenges of our times. Now, as yet another milestone in our rapidly transforming strategic partnership, we keenly look forward to the visit of President Obama in November this year. The state visit of our Prime Minister last year focused on going beyond just the bilateral di dimensions of this relationship to forge a global partnership. We hope that President Obama's upcoming visit would prove to be a major step forward in not only consolidating what our two democracies have jointly achieved, but also for working together in areas where we are yet to see concrete progress, including genuine reform of international institutions with India given its due place. The growing support for a permanent seat for India in the UN Security Council would no doubt go a long way in enabling India to play its role to its full potential and in realizing the idea of India-US relations being a key strategic partnership of the 21st century. Thank you. Well, we, we certainly thank you for that cogent and comprehensive view, not just of U.S.-India uh, relations, but of course uh, their connection to India's uh, strategic visions. The floor is open for questions. Sir, the, uh, the question was, uh, uh, do the Maoists in northern India have legitimate complaints? Mm -hmm. And what can the government do to reduce the, the violence? Well, I think that the legitimate complaints uh, probably relate to the lack of development, and that's an issue which very much is at the forefront of uh, the government of India's policies with regard to the Maoists. Uh, these are, you know, the uh, problem is broadly located across the tribal belt in India, and it also uh, in, uh, includes how you can bring uh, tribal populations into the modern economy and the modern polity. So I think on both these fronts, uh, the government is uh, keen to move and has a range of policies. The, the question is, what have the call centers sure. uh, had uh, as an impact on your economy? I think the first sector of the Indian economy uh, which took off after the reforms was the sector of information technology, which used India's human capital and didn't need very much infrastructure except communication links to link up with the global economy. Um, this provided the confidence in India that India could make a success of the economic reforms and was, as I said, the first significant sector of the Indian economy to witness fast growth. So whether it was information technology or information technology enabled services like call centers, I think they've had a significant impact in India, not just economically, but because it has modernized the Indian idiom. 
And, um, you know, as somebody said, for the first time in India, it didn't matter so much who you knew, but what you knew. And so it created a merit-driven uh, sector of the economy uh, with links to the modern world and therefore a modern culture. I, I think you were asking, are there any shadows uh, with respect to your nuclear industry? No, nuclear agreements with America. Oh, they, okay, thank you. With respect to the recent uh, agreement uh, with the United States. Uh, I think that uh, we are working our way towards full implementation of the agreement. And uh, I think that the issue of our divergent uh, postures on the nuclear issue uh, had constrained our ability to realize the full potential of our relationship with the India-US nuclear agreement. I think that is no longer the case. We have put that behind us. And now we are really focusing on putting in place all the steps necessary to fully implement the agreement and proceed with commercial cooperation. Would it be Sorry. fair to say that you want an answer to the demographic problem of, of youth in India? Uh, I think the, um, there was a high population growth rate which India experienced post-independence. Uh, we were growing at 3% a year, which is quite a high rate of population growth. But you know, if you look at the statistics and the situation that we inherited at independence, it, wasn't, uh, it was quite grim because our literacy rate was 17%. Our uh, life expectancy uh, for women was 28 years. So I would have been a statistic. And uh, our uh, uh, economy had grown for 50 years prior to independence at 0.5%. So complete economic stagnation. And in that situation of social backwardness, economic backwardness, we had a very high growth rate of population of 3%. The latest national sample surveys uh, show that this has come down to around 1.5%, which uh, we think will be confirmed when we have the new census. So the growth rate has definitely been declining. But in the meanwhile, we have this bulge. Um, there are people in India who feel that other countries at similar stages have seen uh, a huge burst of energy and economic dynam dynamism, which has helped to spur growth within the economy. The challenge for us, as I said, is to ensure that we can equip these youngsters to be productive and to play a constructive role. Question is, what are you doing about clean drinking water? It's one of the priorities that we have. Uh, both in the urban areas and uh, somewhat more difficult in the rural areas because we have over 600,000 villages uh, across India, which can give you a sense of the nature of the challenge. So it's difficult to take piped water all the way there, and therefore we uh, struggle with other means to ensure water supply in these areas. But it's a key challenge for us, and we would like to both deploy appropriate technologies, uh, water conservation methods, and uh, better systems of distribution uh, to address this challenge. Would you comment on the uh, mm. uh, contrast between rapid growth on one hand and the slowness of reaching the poorer sections of the country? Uh, I think I mentioned that in my speech, that the challenge for us is not only to sustain a high rate of growth of 8 to 10 percent for the next decade and beyond, but also to ensure that this growth is inclusive. Uh, we have, post-independence, uh, placed more emphasis on equity than on growth. And we found that we were merely subdividing the cake you know, into ever smaller pieces without being able to grow it. So growth is necessary as a first principle, but it's not sufficient. And therefore, we need to have intervention by the government uh, to uh, promote uh, social development, education, and to equip uh, people to participate productively. We also have a range of schemes that we have introduced 
particularly in the rural areas, to reduce rural vulnerabilities, including uh, an, a kind of a social welfare scheme uh, for employment guarantees of 100 days for one person in each family deemed to be below the poverty line in the rural areas. The, uh, the, the follow-up question is that perhaps the government is not doing enough. Would you care to comment? I think Sulab is, uh, an, uh, is an NGO which is quite active in this field. And I think they have got government support across a very broad spectrum to provide facilities. Uh, but part of the problem has been that the movement into the cities has been so rapid mm -hmm. and the growth of the cities has been so rapid that urban infrastructure has not kept pace. Uh, we have now a Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission which is looking at upgrading urban infrastructure in 60 uh, key cities across the country and is using centrally sponsored fiscal incentives to improve governance structures in the large cities. In 30 words or less, <laughs> would, would, would you explain the issues of Kashmir and what India is trying to do well, to defuse it? That might be the subject of another lecture. <laughs> well, the issues are that, you know, uh, it's very complex, it, it's a little complex in terms of India's history because we had colonial India and then we had the princely states. Uh, there were, I think, over 500 or maybe 600 princely states. I'm not you know, sure exactly how much, but quite a number of princely states. And when colonial India became independent, the princely states were given the option of joining either India or Pakistan or remaining independent. Now, Jammu and Kashmir was a kingdom. Uh, the king, uh, the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, didn't take a quick decision. And in the meanwhile, the Pakistanis decided to send tribal invaders into Jammu and Kashmir, whereupon he sought the help of the Indian government to beat back the invaders. And India said, we have no locus standi because you haven't taken a decision on what you want to do. Whereupon he signed the instrument of accession to India and Jammu and Kashmir became formally part of the Indian Union, a fact which has been accepted even in the United Nations. Uh, we sought a ceasefire. We helped to beat back the tribal invaders up to a point, and then we had a ceasefire. So you have now a uh, division, and uh, uh, the ceasefire line was later converted into a line of control and following the similar agreement between the two countries, the ceasefire line was actually mapped between the two countries formally on maps, which were signed and exchanged. And this agreement also committed both countries uh, to seek to resolve these issues peacefully and in the meanwhile not take any unilateral steps to alter the status quo. So in a sense, it froze the situation um, as far as India is concerned, we hold regular elections uh, and we think that the essential problem is that of terrorism, uh, much of it being the backwash of Afghanistan because many of the Mujahideen groups which were created to fight the Soviet Union in Afghanistan uh, stayed on and turned their mind to other objectives including um, Muslim states which were seen to have abandoned the cause of true Islam, uh, Western liberal democracies, and non-Muslim states with Muslim minorities. Would you uh, care to comment upon the potential impact in the region of a withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan? Well, um, we have, uh, we believe that there is need for sustained engagement in Afghanistan. It's not a situation which lends itself to a quick fix solution. Uh, the US uh, administration has also conveyed to us that uh, they do not envisage any rush for the exits, uh, but see this as the beginning 
of a multi-year transition process where responsibilities will be gradually uh, transferred uh, to the Afghans. Would you comment on Sino-Indian relations, prospects, and future? I think, you know, both China and India are Asian countries. We are all civilizations, and we want to build our relationship with China in a non-conflictual manner. Our uh, relations have become more broad-based. We have regular political consultations between the leaders at summit level. Our economic relationship has been growing. Uh, and uh, as our prime minister said, there is space enough in the world to have large economies like India and China growing simultaneously. And if they continue to grow, they could become engines which will power the global economy. The question is, what sectors of the economy are most important to the rate of growth which you suggested? And would it depend mostly upon domestic or foreign markets? The um, Indian economy uh, has seen a huge growth in the services sector, as I mentioned, which has been the first sector to respond to the opening of the Indian economy. But in recent years, we are seeing the manufacturing sector turn around and we've acquired niche capabilities in areas such as automobiles, automobile components, cement, steel, pharmaceuticals, generic drugs, chemicals, and so on. Um, but we also need to grow agriculture as the third segment of the economy because such a majority of our people continue to live in the rural areas and be dependent on agriculture for a livelihood. So as far as India is concerned, we would seek to build our economy on three pillars, uh, services, manufacturing, and agriculture. Indian growth has been different uh, to the East Asian model because it hasn't been export-led growth. In fact, even today, our exposure to global trade is still relatively low uh, by Asian standards. Uh, our growth has come largely from expansion of domestic demand and expansion of domestic investment. And the rates of both domestic savings and investment today, which hover in the region of 34 to 36, sometimes 37 uh, percent, give us the confidence that we will be able to sustain these growth rates uh, in a balanced way. The, uh, the question has to do with social status and, and uh, differentiations within the society. Um, how is that progressing? I think um, India, you know, abolished untouchability uh, at, in our constitution when we became independent. And we also um, adopted one of the most uh, wide affirmative action programs with a constitutional mandate uh, providing 23% of reservation uh, in Parliament for the communities who had hitherto been untouchable and the tribes. So today they are called the scheduled castes and tribes because they are mentioned in the schedule of the Constitution. What we are seeing is a transformation in the nature of caste, particularly in the urban areas. It's no longer a hereditary occupation as it used to be. People from any caste can aspire to be anything, and many do uh, avail of the mobility which this economic growth provides. At the same time, they've become tools of political, this has become a tool of political mobilization. Maybe if I give you an example, uh, you know, how identities in the um, melting pot of uh, US politics have emerged, which are really reconstituted identities. You know, you have something called the Hispanic vote, or you have something called the black vote. Now, this Hispanic vote encompasses people from Cuba, from Guatemala, from Venezuela, countries who may never have had anything to do with each other. But when people here mobilize politically, then you have something emerge as a new identity called the Hispanic vote. The same thing with the African-American vote or the black vote within the US. Now, caste has increasingly become 
a tool for political mobilization within India, and there are reconstituted caste identities which are playing across the field very much along these lines. Um, to your question, what more can be done, I think I'd just draw your attention to the fact that legislating social change uh, is not easy. It's easy to do the legislation, but social change comes with a change in social attitudes. And to give an example within the United States, it took more than 100 years from the abolition of slavery to the institution of civil rights, and then many years thereafter for attitudinal prejudices to begin to dissipate. So it's not something which you can conjure up immediately. It's a process. Focusing on the Muslim community within India, how do they relate to the West, to other uh, mm -hmm. Muslim countries, and uh, to the issues of militancy? Uh, the Muslim population in India has been overwhelmingly moderate. They participate in democratic politics. They uh, know that their vote counts. And uh, uh, Islam overall in India has been a mellow uh, uh, religion. Um, we are concerned uh, at uh, you know, how uh, the waves of extremism from outside can impact uh, on our Muslim community, and uh, how do we engage them uh, to uh, uh, ensure uh, that uh, uh, they continue to be very much part of the Indian mainstream? The uh, question is, how do the uh, populations break down within mm -hmm. Kashmir? And if an election were held, what would be the results? Well, I just want to say that we've held several elections, <laughs> including for the national legislature, including for the state legislature, where more than 60% voted, and including for the local level bodies. So we have been holding periodic elections on our side, uh, but I can't say the same for the other side. Yeah. Did they, did they vote, did they vote on independence? That's, that's not something that uh, is on the agenda. The question was, was there a vote on independence? And uh, you and heard If I may just draw your attention also to the UN resolution on this issue, which basically said, when we had the ceasefire line, first of all, that Pakistan must withdraw all troops from its side of the border, that India should reduce its troops because they accepted the accession to India, and then that there should be a referendum. Pakistan never implemented the first part of the resolution, so the rest of it became redundant and was overtaken by subsequent agreements, including the Simla agreement. And the first part of the question was percentages as to Muslim versus non-Muslim. Um, you know, I don't know the percentages precisely, but Jammu is broadly Hindu. Uh, the Kashmir Valley has a majority Muslim population, but the culture was composite, and they also had a Kashmiri Hindu population, which was driven out and is, uh, you know, has, have been refugees in Delhi and the other parts of India. And Leh is largely Buddhist, so it's not you know, a uniform uh, population mix. The question is what, is, what is the potential or future role of foreign educators within India? I think that would be what they want it to be. Um, we have already uh, you know, a framework which permits collaboration uh, between uh, Indian universities and foreign universities in terms of academic exchanges, uh, you know, formation of curriculum and so on. Uh, what the Foreign Education Providers Bill will do will be to create a framework uh, for uh, foreign universities to set up campuses within India within the framework of the law once it is passed. Any Indian military uh, presence in Afghanistan? No, we don't have any military presence in Afghanistan. And uh, this is largely in deference to regional sensitivities uh, because we want to be helpful. We don't want to complicate the situation further. And therefore, we have uh, largely focused on a development role, as I mentioned in my speech. Would you comment, sure. please, on, on uh, the attempts to resolve the Kashmir issue? I think this is something we see as our internal issue. Uh, 
and uh, we are engaged in meeting Kashmiri aspirations and providing them political opportunities for democratic participation. Uh, you still call the West part, West Pakistan part of Kashmir as an internal issue when we see that, you know, we see photographs of Kashmiris being beaten up by Indian military. And that's the question we have is obviously they don't want to be a part of India. And they feel that they are in Well, that's your interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> it might be my interpretation, but we see these, you know, well, you sure. know, you can see the Quran burning here as well when somebody pulls a page out because some of the recent violence was in response to that. Well, Quran was burning, didn't actually what I'm well, saying let's, is let's that that's a, that's a visual and it may not be the whole truth. Would it be fair to ask you what you think is the extent and nature of the, the protests within Kashmir. Can you quantify that or describe it in any way? I think the situation had improved considerably. As I said, we've had elections, we've had economic growth, uh, but we've seen in recent months uh, a renewal of demonstrations and protest. It's something which the Indian government uh, will have to take cognizance of and find ways to deal with. Does the Chinese military buildup frighten anybody? <laughs> well, we have um, defense exchanges with China and also steps for confidence building, including some uh, joint exercises that have been undertaken. Uh, we are trying to build our relationship in a non-conflictual way and to find positive areas of cooperation. Uh, but there is concern about the capacities that are being built and the lack of transparency. The, the, the question of a road from Agra to the Taj Mahal, and I, and I think that was in the papers recently, and there have been some protests against the building of it. Is that what you're... Yeah. That's, that's normal in a democracy. I think the process, <laughs> <laughs> the process will play out. Thank you. How, how open is uh, India to foreign direct investment? I think pretty open. We have a very liberal uh, structure. Uh, foreign direct investment is allowed uh, almost 100% in most sectors. Uh, there are a few sectors where there are some limits in terms of the ceiling. Uh, but I see, for instance, that the US also has limits, for instance, uh, in terms of newspapers or in terms of uh, radios and so on and so forth. So different countries have different ceilings. Uh, but by and large, the FDI sector is pretty open, including the infrastructure sector, where mostly we allow 100% FDI. Mrs. Peck. In fact, today, um, in terms of actual investment flows, India uh, is the third most attractive destination for foreign direct investment. And this year, it seems in the first half, we might have become the second most attractive destination. But I don't know if we'll retain it till the end of the year. <laughs> the observation was made that you said that uh, there have been several reforms to encourage direct investment. And the question is, what were they and what remains to be done? I think the reforms really were to open the Indian economy. I think, firstly, we dismantled the internal uh, system of regulation, whereby industries required licenses and permits from the government, and this used to be called the license permit Raj. Um, it also ensured that we were a seller's market because there was no competition. You know, domestic competition was squeezed because of licensing, external competition because of high tariffs, and constraints on the policy allowing foreign investment. Uh, the net result was that though we built our first car in the 50s, uh, by the 80s, we were still building the same car. It's, I have nothing against it. It's a good car, the ambassador <laughs> car. And it feeds the nostalgia market in the UK. But uh, <laughs> today, we need a more modern industry. And with the opening, this has happened. The second element was to gradually reduce tariffs, uh, do away with the list of imports which were not permitted, et cetera. So we gradually reduced tariffs and opened up the trade regime. The third element was, again, to gradually uh, open up 
do foreign direct investment. Uh, but ours was not uh, an approach to have a cold shower like some of the East European economies did. Ours was more incremental because the need to sustain um, social and political consensus uh, within a democracy is as important as economic rationality. How important is uh, direct investment to India? And how would you compare Indian labor costs with other Asian countries? Um, firstly, let me say I'm not a labor expert, so I don't really know comparative wages uh, across Asian economies. But uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to emphasize that trade in services uh, is broadly balanced between India and the United States. So that's an important factor. Um, the US exports financial services, educational services, et cetera, to India. And if we take a look at the figures, and I'm going by US figures, not Indian figures, uh, in 2008, no, in 2007, sorry, um, India exported $9.6 billion worth of services to the United States. The US exported $9.3 billion worth of services to India. In 2008, uh, the US exported $10 billion worth of services to India. India exported $12 billion worth of services to the United States. So broadly balanced services exchange. When you focus on one aspect which causes uh, some angst sometimes here, I think you don't get the broad picture that it is a two-way flow. Um, the second uh, aspect in terms of uh, foreign investment, well, as I said, the Indian economy has been driven largely by an expansion in domestic demand and domestic investment, and domestic investments have been responsible for more than 90% of investments in India. In recent years, FDI has increased. I think uh, FDI inflows have been in the region of $30 billion uh, in recent years, the last two, three years. And FII inflows, actually, which can sometimes be problematic because they come in for short-term gain, uh, have also increased. And these are largely from the United States. So your pension funds and others invest in the Indian stock market and make profits and draw their money out when they've made the profits. So again, it's a two-way street. <clears throat> Not a wasted moment. This has been an extraordinarily informative evening. We're deeply grateful, Madam Ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you.